Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's pretty unenthusiastic, right? It's going to be one of those classes. Come on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Neil, what's that about? <laughs> Well, initially, it made me think of something that one of my previous managers also told me is um, in the manufacturing plan, go out there and completely take or just focus on one thing and look for that specific thing, and then you'll see, you'll see what you're trying to find. So, but yeah, it just boils down to if you don't look wide enough, you'll only focus in what, to what you want to see. So. Jack? Conjure up any thoughts with you? Yeah, I mean, I thought of the converse, which is it's not the stone you see that trips you. So, but yeah, I definitely think your focus of where you're looking, you won't see stuff that you're not looking for. Good point. Yep. Chance? Um, yeah, they, they talk in science a lot about um, people get so focused in on trying, they, they think they know the result they're going to get of an experiment, and they get so focused in on trying to find that result right. that they miss. They miss what's going on outside and, and maybe causing them issues or, or a whole different principles at play in their experiment that they don't know, they're not seeing. So. Yeah, good one. Who else? You, you all know what regression analysis is? Go to XY plot and there's some data points there. And what's the first thing that people tend to do? Fit a slope? Or fit yeah, they fit a curve. line to it. They yeah. put a line to it, right? They try to find the middle of it. The real interest is not in the middle, it's on the extremes. Okay, why were these able to do so well and why did these do so poorly? Okay, and there's a whole analysis that talks about boundary analysis, okay, and if you wanna learn something that's useful, don't go looking for the average, go looking for the boundaries and understand what's happening at the boundary conditions. But we're so attuned to from statistical courses to go find the median, go find the mean, go find the middle. And we talk about the others as outliers and maybe they should be tossed because they don't, they don't go to the mean. So what do we see here? Emily, we'll make it easy for you. What do you see? It's one of those trick pictures or something. <laughs> you don't see anything? What? No, I'm just, well, I mean, it looks like a lake with a really weird tree and people looking at the lake, but. Okay. I think it's a couple. Is so it what? It's a couple, like a man and a woman looking at the future. Oh, the two, the people there? Yeah, a couple. It, yeah, I see that. Well, it, first of all, it's a picture uh -huh. that represents an image. Uh -huh. uh, in this moment, it appears that the image as a lake, uh, apparently an island, mm -hmm. uh, trees, uh, rocks, sand, etc. There's a baby in the picture. Really? Yeah. 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 Baby's the foot is up on the right by the tree. Oh. Yeah, the face is on yeah. the left. I don't see it. <laughs> is it? The tree is uh, the tree <laughs> tree. Here's the baby's head. There's the body. Here's the feet. Still don't see it. Oh, I see it. See, see look at the outline. Right. The outline of this the is the baby's head. face. Baby's the head. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Body <laughs> and the feet. Yeah. It's a trick picture. No, it's not a trick picture. <laughs> I just didn't see it. I still don't see it. <clears throat> Go there. You see it. <laughs> See the outline of the tree branches. It's a very large baby. It fills almost the whole screen. Okay, Emily, we'll give you another shot. What do you see? Oh, no. Oh, so <laughs> I mean, I still I just see a face, like the eyes, oh, good. And, the okay, yeah. and the lips, and the chin, and the neck, but. I know it's not the old lady one, at least. I've seen that one before. <laughs> I can see the word liar. Liar, yeah. yeah. Ah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sideways. Liar. Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> You're having trouble with these. <laughs> <laughs> Liar, L I A R. Yeah. <laughs> okay, one more to go. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it is. Okay, it's a man bending over, and you see his rear end. Okay, you ready for this? Do you see him? Yeah. yeah. It's not what I wanted to see. Like yeah. my my like I can see it because you told me about that, but I didn't <laughs> see that off the bat. But what do you see? I mean, it looks like a guy with a helmet, helmet on, on or like a statue or something like that. Right. So at least some of you, if you were told what you should be looking for, saw what is for most people the not the first thing they see. That it usually. A lot of people won't see the man bending over, but almost everybody on their first thing would, okay? So we're back to this point. What you see depends upon what we look for. Everybody agree with that? You have to be able to see in order to improve something. Does that make sense? You have to be able to see what's happening in order to improve something. If you can't see it, you can't improve it. So what's the best way to see? <coughs> By the way, today's session is all about seeing. That's why we're... Because seeing is so important to improving. But... How do we see? Yes. So I read something a couple weeks ago, and it was for advice for writers. If you're writing mm -hmm. to, and he was saying, you know, try to really put yourself in the perspective of whomever you're writing to. You know, mm -hmm. like really get immersed, think about what they do with their day, you know, who they interact with, right. what they go about, kind of like like putting yourself in your customer's shoes. Yeah, and see it from their perspective. Yeah. Try to really, really not like superficially, but get in like what their experience is like, and then maybe you can see their problem. Well, I, I remember once I started to implement uh, 5S in an area, mm -hmm. and suddenly I remember that all the supervisors and my boss were complaining because they said, no, but we will have to put a lot of uh, labels everywhere because we have a lot of uh, stuff, and you want to have everything for one place, and I say, well, that's the first mm -hmm problem that we have a lot of stuff, stuff. that we are not currently right. using. Right. So I would say that usually you should have to start making an, an order, uh, cleaning, etc., in order to see what really happens. I think the best way to see, like, in general, is take everybody's opinion because some people can see something and somebody else okay. can see something. So everybody's together will... Uh, uh, give a collective image which you might want to see. And the more diverse the group, the more likely they're, they're going to see different aspects of this, right? <coughs> if everybody's pretty much the same, they're going to see it the same. Right? So this is one argument for diversity, right? That diversity helps you see things you wouldn't otherwise see. So here were some points. How about being there? Yeah, a lot of managers have meetings, right? And they don't gather in the work area, whatever the work area might be. They gather in an isolated area, and they actually think that in meetings they can see things, okay, that we're going to learn something. Well, Lean and Agile is very much about go see, right? Go see for yourself. Go where the work is being carried out. So I had companies in various locations, and I tried on a sort of six-week schedule to visit every one of those locations and spend typically two days there. But the first thing I did was to go out into the workspaces and start walking around. It's called managing by walking around. 
and I was just interested in what I would see. I would talk with individuals and say, what's, what's happening, right? And just listen and just observe. Now, the people who were in the management of that location were very uncomfortable with this practice because what I was supposed to find out was what they thought, what they perceived, and what they wanted me to hear, right? And the way that they could control that situation was in a meeting, right? So they would have much preferred that the first thing we did was have a meeting of all the plant managers or the appropriate managers within the plant. And I said, no, thank you. I will appear, I will show up when I want to show up, and I'm going to go walk and talk to people, right? And I was not really a test of management or anything else. I was just interested to sort of see what I could see and what people would talk to me about, right? And you, you learn a lot, right? It's called managing by walking around, right? So that's what I mean there by be there. So you don't see in meetings. You see by going to where the activities are taking place and talking, observing yourself, but also talking with people, listening to them, not asking leading questions. In many cases, we just simply talked about what was happening in their personal life. It wasn't necessarily have to be what was happening right there then. Some of the people then talked about, hey, we've we got an issue with this or whatever. And I never used that as a way to be negative about management. It was simply to sort of see the picture of the world that they were seeing and that they were comfortable sharing. Experience. Yeah, obviously, uh, as you accumulate more experience, you're now going to be better prepared um, to, at least you should be, to see more of what's going on. You've seen things before. You could be looking for those, right? One problem with experience is you probably may think you've got to figure it out, and so you fit everything into what you think it should be, right? Guides, right? When you go to a foreign country, you often would rely upon people to take me to see this and tell me about this, right? So I can see it through their eyes, their experienced eyes. So guides can be helpful in seeing diverse observers, right? But diverse observers are going to give you more of the picture than a person by themselves. What about models? Remember, models are simplification of the real world designed to focus in on what, are, what somebody perceives as important points. So we've already in this course introduced in the, in the question of customer value. How do we see customer value? And we've talked about various models. Well, look here, look here, look here, look here. And every time we've got one of those boxes or words there, there's other words that aren't there. Which, so in using that model, it's less likely you're going to see things that aren't covered by those words. But we sort of say, hey, we think these models will help you see things, right, in a conscious fashion. And then without preconceptions, and this is the toughest one of all, um, we all have sort of, uh, by our experience, our stuff that's in our head, sort of what we expect to see, and we sort of try to fit things into that. And it's sort of like the regression line that we talked about, like draw a line through the middle of it. And so we sort of do that almost unconsciously, having taught statistics for a long time now, almost unconsciously do that. Okay, well, what does this look like? And is it a straight line? Is it curved? What does it look like, right? And I don't, I'm not inclined, because I've never been trained that way in my statistics courses, to go look at the limits and say, well, hey, what's causing this to be to this, this high and what's causing these folks to be that low, right? And yet that's where new knowledge is going to come from, right? It's called boundary analysis. And there's actually a whole set of mathematical techniques to deal with boundary analysis. Go look at the boundaries and learn what you can learn from those boundaries. And then amplification tools. By this, I mean telescopes and microscopes, right, that we can, this amplifies what we can see. Think about your five senses, right? Well, our five senses pick up those five 
kinds of objects, but they don't pick up other non-objects. But within each of those, we can enhance those capabilities and hence see more by enhancing those capabilities. Right? Microphones and other stuff, pick up sounds that we wouldn't hear otherwise. So those are various possibilities we're seeing. So forget about lean and agile, let's just talk about as managers. So how do you see? Jack, how would you as, uh, are you a manager now? I, I was. You was, okay, when you was. <laughs> uh, I would, um, I didn't actually do this, but I think maybe trying to establish some like measurable quantity and see where you are and what how it changes over time might be a good way to see kind of what's going on. So sort of statistics? Yeah, instead of just saying, hey, I think we do, we're doing good, then actually if you actually have some data to back that up. So numbers, you think, or goals, or some sort of quantification can help you see? I think it can help, yeah. I don't think it's the whole answer, but I think it could help for sure. I think you can take uh, feedback after every maybe three months, six months, one year, and kind of take feedback from the people you are, um, it, who are, you are managing. Right. And then maybe take it positive, negative, whatever it is. Maybe learn from that and see exactly where you stand with them. Yeah, I know one company who uh, once a month uh, sent out a survey to all their employees that in effect took of what's going well, what isn't going well. So they were trying to get feedback um, uh, on a systematic and continuing basis to sort of see <coughs> how employees were seeing how the company was doing, not just how they were seeing it going, right? So it fits into sort of what you're talking about there. Uh, we had an interesting discussion topic last week, and um, it was about true leadership and when you, you know, if you have to leave a company and how the company survives. But somebody mentioned that they were gone for two weeks and they were manager, and there, when they got back, there was a ton of work piled up that was unable to be done with, with their absence. And they said this instantly threw up a red flag and they needed to figure out what piece of this work was unable to be done while they were gone. Right. And so that really kind of, you know, threw my mind and thinking, you know, when you're gone, how things operate in your absence will tell you a lot actually about what's going on maybe that you don't realize. So there we go. Okay. It's just an introduction to the whole notion of seeing and how important it is in management in general, you have to have pretty good vision. You have to be able to see things <coughs> if you're a manager. And so I, I think it'd be good to ask yourself, how are you going to see? Is it, is it monthly reports? Is it feedback from employees? And how do you collect that feedback? You know, how do, how do you see? Do you walk around and meet people informally? Do you have off-site things, go out for beer on Friday afternoons or something because you will hear things in an informal setting that you will never see in an office setting, right? So what are your tools for seeing as a manager? Very, very important topic, right? People who just simply rely on reports that come to them in their office are going to see something, but they're going to not. They're not going to see very much, right? Those people who get out and manage by walking around are going to have a chance to see a lot more. Right? So think about that. Yep. Are you going to talk about this idea of managing by walking around more later? No. No. I feel like. It's something that has popped up here and there, and uh, maybe I just need to go do more research on it. And I, I just wonder how that works very well with a lot of jobs moving to more virtual and remote teams. And maybe it's just hmm. something I'll look up offline. It's a longer walk. It's a much longer <laughs> walk, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the point is to get out of the office, out of that setting and get into the setting where the people are, right? And to do that without necessarily an agenda, right? Which, which is helping to let the people where you're walking around help set the agenda. And it's also an effort to bypass some organizational constraints, 
right? Because the normal rule is you can only communicate people within your level or the level above you, right? And you only can communicate freely within your part of the organizational chart. You can't do this, okay? But now think if <coughs> we talk about managing by walking around, what if employees in general were encouraged to walk around and find out what's happening elsewhere in the organization? Right? That's not their job, but no, the point, we're gonna talk a lot in here about flow and flow, as we're going to talk about it, is flow delivering value to the customer. And we deliver value to the co customer across the organizational chart, not within the silos of the organizational chart. And so when we talk about improving flow of value, we have to be talking about how do we get a smooth, continuous flow across the organization. And you don't do that by emphasizing discipline or um, what do we call it? departmental structures, right? That accountants only talk to accountants and engineers only talk to engineers and marketing people only talk to marketing people. The way you deliver customer value is across that. So we're gonna need to set up communication capabilities that cut across the organization. Right. Okay. But do a, you, uh, do a Google on managing by walking around. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. Seeing, 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 okay. All right, so as is our custom, improve your system and what are the hidden circles? Focus on value. Uh-huh. Focus on waste. Okay. Focus on processes. Yeah. And focus on product. Nope. You're almost there. I thought we were going to score an A+. Plus. <laughs> no, you can't look now. Come on, Neil. <laughs> the purpose of these is not to go back to your Focus notes. Purpose is, I was hoping by now these things would be beginning to stick. Okay, so what's the last one? Focus on flow. But focus on flow. Okay. So since we haven't gotten to that one, okay, I'll forgive you this time. Okay. So here they are. Value, waste, process, and flow. So value, <coughs> we talked about three kinds of clients. Chance, you're gonna nail this one. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, you nailed the other one just about. Alan, what are the three kinds of clients? Um, the user. Right. The one who is paying. Right. And the, um, the next, and the next, next step in the process, right? Exactly, you nailed it. Okay, great. So next step in the process, end user, and writes the check. And we said, wh which of these should we start with? Step. Next step in the process, okay. That's the one where the relationship should be the most obvious and so on and so forth, okay. Something we should have control about. And then we, t we had some models for potential client value. Anybody remember what the first one was? Four P's. Marketing, four P's, and the four P's were? Product, price, promotion, place. Place, okay, those are the four, okay. What was uh, the next job, one? Jobs, jobs to, to be, be done. done. Jobs to be done, and what was the point of jobs to be done? To uh, know why a customer is hiring a particular product. Or service, right? Or In other service. words, why are they hiring this product or service? So that was jobs to be done. Did we get to the third one? Lean consumption. Lean consumption. And this was the one we just barely touched upon, okay. But any remember anything about it? Uh, basically about removing uh, waste with respect to customer, uh, like uh, whatever is unnecessary for customer. It's, it's a, a clear customer focus, we'll talk about it. And then the client benefit package, anybody remember what that was about? Experience that the client's buying, so not just the product, but anything else around it. We put it into two key words. Anybody remember what the two key words were? Primary. No, okay. Tangible oh, and intangible. Yeah. Right, okay, so marketing, you got this one, right? So this is one model you could use. J 
tabs to be done. This was Clayton Christensen, right? Which was kind of, remember the milkshake <coughs> example? Important to understand. Lean consumption. All goods work together, and by all goods, it wouldn't just mean your products, but it would mean all the things that, that the client has to have work together. So make it sure it fits into their time, what they want, where they want it, when they want it. And that's about as much as we went into that. But there's a whole book on that subject, okay? But it is totally client-focused. It's not what's happening inside your operation. It's totally focused on the client. Yes? Yesterday I had gone for Denver Startup Week, and there was a session on lean consumption and uh, jobs to be done. Oh, really? So apparently, uh, the video that you showed, yeah. he's coming up with a book in November. Okay. So this jobs to be done is the in thing in market research. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was pretty good. We're, we're ahead of the marketing folks again. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then the client benefit package, tangibles and intangibles, creates that create the client experience. Tangibles, we gave examples of food at a restaurant, auto parts, contents of a hotel room. What are the tangibles for this session? Grades. The what? The grades. Okay. The knowledge. Okay. Slides. Slides. The presence here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid I was going to have to slip you a piece of paper with that. <laughs> So grades, right, that's something that is of value, right? The lecture, the slides, what about the online discussion, right? What else? Classroom discussion, right? Opportunity to do that. Okay, intangibles, words like this. What are the intangibles for this session? Environment, classroom, how is it clean? Okay. Engaging, respectful. Those, those are the intangible kinds of things, right? When you say something stupid and I remind you of it, okay, <laughs> you would say that's not respectful, right? Well, I would hope you would. Right? I'll try not to say stupid <laughs> things. <laughs> No, but aren't you looking for a number of intangible kind of things? The uh, relationships we, we build among mm -hmm. the other students. Right. Yeah, if, if you feel isolated, in other words, or if you feel like, hey, these are people I can chat with in the break and other kinds of things. So there is a social aspect to this. Okay. So this is all review. So value improvement. There were some circles that came out from that. In, we're trying to improve things. Anybody remember what the next circle was? Are you, are you cheating? No, it's not. It's not. Oh, no, I just don't remember this. Oh, okay. People. Right? Improvements are brought about by the people who discover and validate those improvements. What's the next thing on improving? Process. Process, right? Process is very, very important. In fact, the, the focus really is on process and the people then executing that process and improving that process. So process is a big part of how we go about the improvement. So in going about the improvement, we talk about people a lot, we talk about process a lot, and then there's last one more circle. Power. Power, right? That, hey, somebody says, you're going to do this or in business performance excellence, it comes from the top of the organization and flows itself down through the organization, right? So that's power, and I put that in a pale red because that's, we don't emphasize that in this course. There are other methodologies where that's essential to it, okay? It, that is how you measure the success of it. Does it accomplish the top level objectives, right? And this is a systematic way of doing that to accomplish top-level objectives. I'm the actual total reverse of that. 
which is to start with your system and then begin to expand outward from that, right? So this is very much a bottoms-up kind of approach. So on the process side, we hit a mantra. Anybody remember what the mantra was? Three parts to it. Have a process. Have a process. Follow, follow, the, process, follow the process. Improve the process. Improve the process. Improve the process. Exactly. So that <clears throat> very important mantra. Um, we had limited processes in my companies. We certainly had them in, in accounting. I mean, this is how you keep financial data. We certainly had them in the manufacturing part of the company, right? Very spelled out. Travelers, step one, step two, step three, step four. People were required to actually sign off on each step on the traveler. So we had very detailed processes for manufacturing, but we did not have that, say, for example, marketing. There wasn't a process, there weren't a set of processes that marketing did. They did marketing, however, they chose to do marketing. So we didn't, you know, I'm not saying this was good, I'm saying it was against the philosophy here. Philosophy is for all your significant activities, you should have spelled out processes. Right? And that should not be tied to particular people. In other words, whoever is in this role will follow this process. This is the process for doing this. And it will be followed. The secret sauce then is the person then improving that process, demonstrating that it can be improved. Right? So we were sort of had a mixed scorecard. I'd probably give us a C minus, okay? We were not nearly as process oriented as we're going to talk about here, because process orientation is absolutely critical to what we're going to talk about here. And then we talked about the process maturity model, okay, and you can find literature on this, and it typically has five levels. Level one processes or anything at all. So in our marketing efforts in my companies, it could be anything at all. This person did it this way, this person did it that way. Um, customer service, we didn't even have a script for how people answered the phone, right? So we didn't have processes. Would it have been better if we had had processes? Absolutely. Secondly, then, processes are defined, documented, practiced, and people are trained in them. So if you were going to be at level two in the capability maturity model, this is where you would be at. And I think I mentioned last time that there you can actually have outside examiners come in <coughs> and certify you at one of these levels. And some companies require their suppliers to be at one of these levels. In order to be a supplier to us, you would have to be certified, for example, to be at level three. And if you're not certified by an outside auditor at level three, you can't be a supplier to us. Four processes are and measured quali quantitatively and evaluate it with this data. And then lastly, continuous improvement. Right? So up through four, it could be fixed, right? In other words, once we've got one, and it's quantitative and all of that, but we never improve it, right? So that's why five is we have a way to, to continually improve. Five. So people and processes are sort of at the core of what we're doing inside the organization. Outside the organization, we're focused on client value. But inside the company, we're going to first of all be focused on people and process. And then finally, we're going to be focused on flow. Right? But we're not the flow yet. That's sort of the last step in the process. So bad processes will overwhelm good people. People are important because they, they carry out the process and they improve the process. Management's responsibility is to make it possible for people to have great processes and always looking at the side effect that processes can have upon people. So this is just the neat, I always like the little thing right here, fixing the process, right? So no big message there. Okay, so that's the review. And I'm sensing that some of it's beginning to stick, right? Because all of it, we're laying a foundation, okay? And if you can... Keep that foundation if that foundation becomes important. And then as we add on to that, right, then in fact you'll be in a much better position. So seeing the operative system. None of us sees reality. We see 
a portion of reality, and we see that portion of reality that fits with our model of the world. Right? If my model of the world is that the world is unjust, I'm probably going to see a lot of injustice. If, uh, uh, if I see the world as a, as a place full of opportunity, I'll probably see opportunities. So none of us can see the total reality, right? So the battleground is between our ears so that we can see things. So let's give you an awareness test. Anybody seen this awareness test? If you have, don't say anything. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! So how many? 13. Uh, here's some 13s. Any others? I wrote 13. 13? So you all saw 13. Did you see anything else? Counting the basketball passes, I didn't. The answer is 13. But, did you see the moonwalking bear? You don't know it. You don't see it. No! <laughs> did you see it? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> or do I have to play it again? <laughs> you saw it? You saw the moonwalking bear? So what's the purpose of showing you that? That if we are focused on something too much, then we kind of tend to miss a lot of big picture. Or, or just other stuff, right, that may or may not be important. But the fact is, the more focused you are, the more likely it is that you might miss things that are important, right? right? And you had been given a model beforehand, count the passes. Right? So it's, I didn't see the walking bear the first time years ago when I first had this video, right? Because our focus is so strong that we blot out everything else. So I want to go a little bit beyond that, though. It's easy to miss something you're not looking for. So this was the situation. So we've got these folks, right, who we might think about in an organization as sort of functional areas. They're really focused in on what's happening within their functional area within the organization. What we'd like to do, okay, is to get them focused on the client. Right? Or we should say the clients, right? Because we've talked about three clients, next step, end user, person who writes the check. So do you agree with this statement now that we start it with? I mean, it really is true, isn't it? And we, we voluntarily make ourselves blind. Right? Part of this is our training. We're trained to be a, in a particular way and to see certain things more clearly than perhaps other people see them. But the better we are at seeing a in a particular way, the more likely we're apt to be blind in other ways.
So how to see the system? We're going to talk about seeing value, and we started that process. The suggestion I've made is that you need a model, okay, of value. And I've given you four models to think about for value and said you should think about utilizing a model for value as a way to help you see. It's a, it's a set of glasses that we're to put on to be able to see. Then we're going to say, well, how do we see waste? How do we see process? And how do we see flow? Okay. So seeing value. So I want to talk about a new model. Three types of customer value. Expected value, in terms of a car, I would expect that the car would start the first time I try to turn the key, right? It's an expectation. When I bought my last car a couple of years ago, went and talked to the salesman, I never asked them if the car would start first time. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would have thought I was crazy and called for help if I had. <laughs> but do you think it was important to me that it start the first time? Yeah, absolutely. I also didn't ask him, okay, if it had headlights. <laughs> well, I could verify that myself, or at least I could see that it had a place for headlights. But I never asked them, if they worked and if it had a dimmer, right? So I'm so old that when I first started buying cars, cars did not come with an outside rear view mirror on the driver's side. It was an option. If you pay extra money, right, you could get an outside mirror on the driver's side. If you had one on the inside, right, but there was not one on the outside. Cars did not come with radios. Radios were an add-on, right? Cars didn't come with radio antennas. They were an add-on, right? So customers have something that they think about expected value. But if you go talk to them, they're not going to tell you about their expectations because they assume that they will be there. <clears throat> and you say, why is that important? Well, suppose you're thinking about things you could take out. In other words, as you're designing something, you say, here's things I want to add, but these things no longer are important. How do you know which of those are? So Jack, have you flown lately? Uh, yes. Yes, OK. When you called up, did you ask them whether the airliner had seats you could sit in? <laughs> it was an expectation. You just assumed, right? <laughs> Did you ask them whether there was going to be a restroom facility? <laughs> no. Right? So, hey, people have expectations, but the tricky part is if you go talk to them about value, there's a whole set of things that they won't talk about because for some reason they've come to expect that those things are included. And they may be included simply out of past practice, not because they're of any value to anybody. Right? Good example would be what, cigarette lighters? Right? Today they're rarely used as cigarette lighters, they're used as what, charging ports. Right? But if, if, we didn't ha if they weren't used as charging ports, and it disappeared, I doubt you'd have very few complaints, okay, from people, some. So then the second kind of customer value is specified value. Cheaper and quicker are good. These are things if you go talk to people, they will actually mention. Right? So what might be some examples of that for a car today? If you go look for a new car, what might you sort of say I'm looking for in this car? Backup camera, that's a good one. The what? Greater mileage. Greater mileage, right. Four-wheel drive. Could be four-wheel drive, right? Horsepower. Horsepower, yeah. So there's the things that 
if you went today, you wouldn't be asking about outside rear view mirrors, right? You probably wouldn't be asking about cigarette lighters, right? You probably wouldn't be asking about, is there a light in the glove compartment box? Didn't, it used to be there was no light in the glove compartment box, right? This is all true. You live long enough, you <laughs> same thing will happen to you, right? So that's specified value, and in, that's easy. That's easy. Because right, the customer will talk to you about these things. Not necessarily easy to deliver, but in the sense of discovering what the value is, they'll do that. So we got two categories. And then there's a third category of delightful value. These are things that if you go talk to the customer about, potential client about, they won't mention. But if you include it, they will be delighted. So an example is, um, so in our company, our chairman's son was getting married. This was in Indiana, but it, the marriage was going to be in somewhere in the Carolinas. I don't know whether South, North or South Carolina. So private company, chairman, lots of money. So he rented an airplane to fly a, a bunch of us down there to be at the wedding because I'm sure they wanted to have a lot of people at the wedding, right? So rent an airplane, take off. We're about 30 minutes into the flight. Very comfortable, all sort of a, not coach seating, but business class seating kind of thing. So they come around, the steward, the stu, uh, the, the steward people, and they've got hot buttered popcorn. <laughs> we knew it was coming because we could smell it. Okay, freshly popped on the airplane. If somebody had asked me before this flight, what would you like to have on this flight? I wouldn't have said seats, okay, <laughs> and I wouldn't have said, okay, hot buttered popcorn, freshly popped, but it was wonderful, all right? So that was delightful value. I still remember, I can still taste it today. <laughs> so we get out and have the wedding, get back on the plane, fly back to Indiana. On the way back, they come around. Waiting, what's going to happen? I'm going to get some more hot buttered popcorn. <laughs> I've been thinking about it throughout the whole wedding. <laughs> they come around with freshly baked hot chocolate chip cookies, giant size. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it was. They were delicious, and you could have as many as you wanted. <laughs> this was not frontier, right? <laughs> no, <it was> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so that's delightful value. People would not have mentioned it if you said, what are you looking for? But if you deliver it, it will be delightful. It will set you apart. People will remember that. So as you design your product or service, the question is, what's expected value? How, people won't mention it because it's sort of come to be the norm, but it, because it's the norm doesn't necessarily mean it has to be there. Right? It's just simply what has been carried over. And then what? The specified value, if you talk to them, what do they say would be valuable? And then the showstopper is what would represent delightful value. Yes? In your examples, and the only ones I can think of, mm -hmm. I feel like delightful value would be cool because it seems like it's not that expensive to add. But maybe it's just the food examples are, are easy. No, it could be very expensive, yeah. I mean, so let's, let's try. You've got a general notion of what these three categories are. This is another model for looking at value, right? This is just another value model, right? So let's take this class. What represents expected value? What did you expect when you walked in here? <laughs> what about... Table and chairs, yeah. Yeah. Lights. Lights. right? Pro proper temperature. Proper temperature, good one, right? Because it, right? So if I would ask you, what are you looking for in this class? You probably none of you would have mentioned. I'd like a chair to sit in. I'd like a table that I could write on. I'd like electrical outlets for my computer. I'd like to be lit so I could actually see the notes or I could see my computer, right? None of those things, right? Could said. 
You probably wouldn't even mention because you come to expect that there will be a screen in which the slides are shown. Right? There will be slides and a screen that I can look at it. Right? So all of these things have really become expected. Right? When I've taught in executive management programs, they expected that there would be coffee and tea and soft drinks and cookies and <laughs> all of that sort of stuff. Okay, that was just sort of their ex expectation, right? Part of the climate. Yes? And I think as far as the instructor goes, like you expect there's an instructor. Specified would be you expect that they know about what they're teaching and right. that delightful might be like, wow, they like really know their stuff and really great at communicating. Yeah, but the point is on the expect that you probably wouldn't mention that like, I think they should have a, a master's degree, at least a master's degree, right? Or at least they, I expect they have some industry, they have some experience, right? Right. But you probably wouldn't mention those things because you've come to expect that they're tip that that requirement is typically met. But it sounds easy, but the tricky part is, is it really worthwhile to continue that? Right. Uh, an example in automobiles is taking, you don't provide a full-size spare tire anymore, or you don't provide a spare tire at all. All right, so delightful value. So note the blue line to the left of that. If it's absent, people are gonna be disgusted. If it's above that, they're going to be sad. They're, they're going to say that's okay. Note the, the, the bottom one, the red one. If it's missing, you won't know about it. But if it's in, it won't increase people's satisfaction because they've come to expect it. But then the green becomes the interesting one. So and your product or service, this is where you can distinguish yourself from your competitors. Everybody's probably going to have to get the expected in their product. Everybody's got a shot at going to talk to clients and finding out what they specify, what they say. But the tricky one is what would be delightful because they won't, they have no idea of that. For example, I never knew you could have freshly bought, freshly popped hot, hot buttered popcorn on a flight, so I wouldn't have even asked for it. And I certainly wouldn't have asked for oversized, freshly baked chocolate chip cookies as many as I wanted, because I didn't even know that was an option, right? Five years ago, I never would have set a backup camera, because no cars had backup cameras, right? Or collision avoidance systems, right? So the tricky part about delightful is that really, you, there's all sorts of stuff you think might be delightful, but how do you validate it other than include it and see what happens, right? So the way this works then is that for the expected, which is the sort of purple line there, you better meet all those requirements. For the um, specified, and these, by the way, are different variables, right? So for the specified, you want to try to meet as many of those as you can. But then the question is, out of all the possible delightful variables, which ones are you going to add to your service or your product? So Neil, what would be a delightful thing to add to this course? Um, in our case, it would be nice to have coffee and cookies and things like that. That would be delightful. You're not, you don't expect it. If you wouldn't, you, if I said, what do you want out of the course before you mentioned this, you wouldn't have specified it. But you're sort of saying, hey, it's two and a half hours long. It's beginning to drag by this point in the day. Why, it'd be nice to have a little pick-me-up. Maybe even a glass of wine or something. <laughs> 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 right? Be delightful. Joe or Dave, any comments on this? What would be delightful? I don't hard to think of something that wouldn't be expected, but I guess. I'm, I'm trying to come up with something, but I'm struggling. Nothing would be delightful if it were available. You can't think of anything. What about if you had an attractive instructor? Would that work? 
<laughs> what about a field trip? Field trip, okay. Let's go see some of this in practice. Sports. Yeah, okay, so there's an example, right? From your other courses, you've not, other engineering management courses, you've not come to expect uh, um, field trips, but a lot of people find field trips pretty interesting, particularly if they haven't got any outside experience to begin with. They're not quite sure what they do in companies. Joe, what about you? Maybe if you were like, oh, well, I only teach the class half the time, so it's like two to three instead of 4.30 or, or something like that, like we only have one discussion to do a week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that would be delightful. Hey, this is a significant commitment of time, and we've all got busy lives and things to do, so somehow this could be condensed, get the same value, right, but in a more efficient fashion. So it's, it's an interesting way to look at a situation, right? First of all, are we clear about what's expected? Secondly, how do we find out what they want, what the, what the client would specify, and then what would delight them? And so remember we talked about the next step in the process. You could use that, go through it. But the interesting one is what would delight the next person in the process? Right? in which they would sort of say, wow, you knocked my socks off. That makes my day. I really appreciate it. Not anything they specify, but something you thought would be above and beyond kind of thing. And by the way, what sets you away from your competitors is do you have any delightful value? And if you have them, are your delightful values more valued than the competitors? Right? So one of the things we did with our... Uh, customer, it was very important for us. The prints that they came up with, we use those prints to manufacture things. And uh, this was in semiconductor equipment. And so we went to them and we sort of said, hey, to the engineers who came up with the prints, who came up with the designs for the various um, um, components and modules, chambers and so on, we sort of said, hey, each, each item on that print costs a certain amount of money to manufacture. Right? And we're willing to tell you if you've got anything on that print that is very expensive to do in manufacturing. Classic example is a right angle. Right? Very hard, except if you're going to put things together, but if you've got a solid block of material, which was often the case, you've got a radius. Right? And they'd specified very tight radiuses. Okay. Very, and the tighter the radius, the more expensive it was to produce that radius, okay? So we sort of said we would be willing at no charge to you, even and not even before we've been awarded the contract. We may not even get the contract. We know manufacturing. You don't know manufacturing, right? We're willing to be your free advisors on your prints with regard to their, the cost to manufacture those various features. So that was a service that we were willing to provide for free. It wasn't altruistic. We wanted to build a working relationship with the engineers, right? Uh, offer some stuff for free that they would find valuable because now they could sort of say, hey, to their boss, this isn't going to cost us $10,000 for this chamber because we've, we've knocked $3,000 out by modifying the print in ways that make no difference. We just didn't know how expensive it was to manufacture certain features, right? So that was, for them, delightful value, right? So think about your customers. What could you do that would make their life better? They would never mention it to you because they didn't know that service was even available or that feature was available. So it's an interesting way to think about things, right? So we talked a little bit about this course. Expected, specified, delightful. We're doing good. Okay, let's keep going. Is this this way of looking at value helpful to you? Yeah, it, it's a completely different than the marketing one. It is a way to separate yourself from competitors by the delightful part. It's a way to focus on making sure they get what they say they want in the specified area. 
and it's a way to make sure that we don't miss something that's important to them in the expected area. Okay? And so if you, if you listed all the expected things, you could go talk to them about them and say, hey, is this still expected? You didn't mention it, but I noticed in the past it's been included, but it would be important for it to continue to be included. Right? So start there, then move to the, to the specified. Okay? And those you probably, if, if they specify it, you want to give those serious consideration. Right? At some level, you want to satisfy that. But then the tricky part is, how do we come up with things that would be delightful? And this is where you're going to distinguish yourself from the competitors who may have nothing that's delightful. Right? Because, for example, the print doesn't have anything delightful in it. This is specified. Right? This is expected. Right? But what would be delightful? And delightful in this case was, we will come do free consulting with you, sit down with you, and tell you how expensive each of these features are. I think the, uh, the iPhone 7 is kind of a funny, if you think of it in these three things, that they, you have the expected value of having a headphone jack on your cell phone. Ex That's the, the word expected is critical here. Yeah, very expected. We no longer would sort of say, I want a headphone jack in my, right. in you my expect phone. It. Yeah, you and expect they were it. going for a delightful um, feature in that it was going to make the phone waterproof if they were to remove it. And a bigger headphone. battery space. And yep, and I think there was, uh, well, then you get the wireless headphones, right. and that's a lot of, it's moving right. to that anyways. Right. And so there were some delightful features that had to get an expected value, you know, had to be axed, and it's, that really trips some people up. So that's kind of yeah. funny. When, when you really expect something, there's a strong, yeah. strong motivation to have that yeah, in your I, I just spent an hour in the Apple store this morning. <laughs> okay, my six iPhone 6 became a brick, okay. Doesn't respond to anything, right? <laughs> so the choice was get a replacement for the 6 or upgrade to the 7, right? And... I decided to stick with the six because there was really nothing that they were going to change. Okay, that w I didn't need a bigger battery, I didn't need a better camera, all those things, and I certainly like to use a headset. So it, it looked like sort of a, a wash to me. So why spend more money, right? Stick with what I've got. So. This is real, but I love that as an, that the Apple one is a great example of expected, right? And it is expected, and taking it out has caused a huge firestorm, right, of people that, hey, this isn't an improvement. Now, they, had, they thought they had good reasons for doing it, but what they failed to say is it really has become almost an expectation, a standard. Now, maybe two generations down the line, when all everybody goes that way, that won't be the case, okay? Um, but like today, if you took out outside rearview mirrors on cars, right, <laughs> you'd hear about it. Right? You mean that's an option now, right? Or don't even make it an option. Right? So I think this is a pretty powerful model for thinking about customer value. And you can read about it. Um, but it gives you a way to cover the three areas about uh, expected, Specified, delightful. <coughs> right? And they each have their own challenge. But I, f I find it really, really helpful. And I think you might think about that. All right. Waste. So that was, we just finished the section on seeing value. Right? In general, what I've said to you is I've given you several models for seeing value. Use any of those models, and you will get a better chance to see that kind of value. For example, the marketing one probably will get you specified value, right? It may not give you expected value, and it certainly won't give you delightful value because go talk to the customer. They won't mention it, right? So remember, every model lets you see, but it also blinds you to what's not in the model. So I've given you multiple models. Pick one that you think is kind of interesting in your situation and start using it. Right? And then eventually you may pick up a second one that you think, hey, this does a good job of seeing pretty, some important things, but here's another one that comes at it in a slightly different way. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll always come at it from two different perspectives. 
and that tends to work pretty well for us. Okay, so let's talk about waste. Seeing waste. So we, I think marketing waste, right? We talked about four Ps. We're going to talk about operations waste, and we're going to talk about knowledge waste. So marketing waste. Not in the consideration set, not meeting expected value. Okay, so one of the ways that marketing looks at things is they sort of said, we need to be in the consideration set. If somebody's looking for a new car, we want to be, and there's cars they will consider. If you've ever done a car, I'm going to go look at this, this, and this, and this. Right? So if I'm looking for um, uh, an SUV, right, that's going to sort of determine which type of cars I look at. Right? So the first challenge for marketing people is to be in the consideration set. Second step is to be competitive, right? You're going to be compared to the competition, right? So got to be in the consideration set. And then the second thing is how do I compare to the, the competitors? And then the third step is not differentiating by not providing delightful value, right? Delightful value is where you're going to really distinguish yourself. So can any of you think of a product that you've bought recently that had a delightful value? Recently uh, switched from CenturyLink to Comcast. I hadn't had a TV, and they gave me the newest box they have. And you can talk to your remote dad now and say football, and it brings up all the football games okay. that are on right now. And so I didn't expect that. I didn't even really know so that So that you could, you could, you could voice control yeah yeah but voice does control that, does that work I it mean, works for the new ones i heard the, the early generations didn't the new ones yeah. are slick you can just say cnn it goes to cnn oh. say football it oh. brings up every football game it's it's getting pretty pretty good yeah this is comcast right comcast yeah and i've got comcast and i've seen that advertised but yeah. they haven't offered me one of those yet so <laughs> i don't know how to get mine so on comcast uh we got the the new latest greatest package or whatever um but like the really budget version, which mm -hmm. looked like a great value. And yeah, it's got the voice activated stuff, but they sent us this really fancy HD box. It doesn't put out HD unless you pay the $10 technology fee. So that, they were fa failing to meet my expected value. Like it's an HD box, my TV's HD. <laughs> <laughs> what gives? Like, yeah. They have their problems for sure. <laughs> Not a fan, but. Other examples of delightful value. Well, I, I remember when I bought this computer, um, I was not thinking that the screen was, was a touch screen. But when I saw in the Best Buy that included the touch screen, I started to think, well, maybe I'm going to need it that in, in the future because all tablets are, are touch screens. So that's why I okay. got it. So something you didn't necessarily s specify. Yes. Didn't even expect, right? But yeah. when you discovered it was there, right? Yeah. I got another one. Uh, my fiance's phone, if you do like a, oh. a little one of this, it like brings up the camera. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It, you don't have to open up the. No, you just. Yeah, just. Really flick of the wrist and the camera app. Is ready to go because often there's a picture you need to get sort of immediately, right? So that's a delightful feature, right? Yeah, I want to know which one that is. Yeah, it's a Droid, I think. Not an Apple product. <laughs> so, so certain things w that were not specified before now are delightful, but eventually they become, quote, a standard, an expectation, and then they're included, right? So then the delightful thing is sort of never, never ending, right? But what you want to do is discover things that others haven't done yet that would be delightful. So very interesting way to look at things. So marketing waste would be not taking advantage of each of those three areas, right? Not providing expected value. If you don't provide expected value, that's waste. If you don't provide specified value, that's waste. And if you don't include delightful value, 
It's waste because you won't distinguish yourself from your competitors. Right? None of our competitors offer their services for free to show them how they could save money by changing what were them inconsequential changes in the print. They just drew it that way. Right? Then operations waste. So marketing, missing the customer's sweet spot, missing one of those specified values, missing one of those expected values, right? missing a delightful value. That would be marketing waste. What's operation waste? That's going to be inside the plant, right? inside the company, inside the operations. Right? So am I? big waste is not providing the value to the client. Right? Little waste is how we go about providing that value. We could be terribly efficient at providing the value, but if it's the wrong value or it's missing value, then that's big waste. So marketing is about big waste. Client value is about big waste. Right? And what we're then going to talk about in waste here is really about inside operations waste. Not that it's insignificant, but it's a smaller part of waste than a bigger error than missing that. So we're going to talk about that next time in more detail. We're going to spend the whole session on operations waste. Right? I want to talk a little bit about knowledge waste. The disruption of knowledge. Disrupting the flow of knowledge. Physical barriers. So I don't, I can tell you 15, 20 years ago what the standard was, but um, prior to that, a lot of the support staff at least had offices, right? I mean, that was the, the thing. You, you expected that if you were hired as an engineer or something, you'd probably have an office, right? Then that be transformed into what? You would have a cubicle, right? But the early versions of that were what? You'd have a cubicle with high walls, right? Then they moved to cubicles but low walls, right? Well, what happened when they went from high cubicle walls? First of all, in, when you were in your own office with a door, you were isolated, right? You, you knew little about what was going on while you were in the office, right? When they then went and moved to high wall cubicles, you knew more because you may have even had a cubicle mate who was in that with you, but you could hear things, right? You could see people walking by. You had a better sense of what was going on. Now when you get to low, cubi low wall cubicles, now suddenly you see a lot of what's going on. And our largest customer built a, this was a, a semiconductor equipment company. I don't know, they probably employed like 5,000 people at that site. But it was all open space offices for the staff, all low wall cubicles. By the way, this was true of the president of that location. He was in low wall cubicle in an open space. Flow of knowledge. In which of those situations, office with a door versus a low wall cubicle in a large open space, which one do you think more information is flowing in? Yeah, the low walls, large space, right? A lot of information. Now, some people find it difficult to work in that environment, but there can be no question about you know more about what's going on. Yep. It depends on what's going on. I mean, there are a lot of offices, there's no cubicles anymore. <coughs> Just, you have a desk next to someone else, right. and that's how that's it, yeah. that's what it is now. Or there's, um, especially in software companies, it's like 
ginormous cubicles almost where like you're not in a wall you're kind of maybe there's room for four or five or right. eight people and so you're in your own little like kind of cubicle but within that there's nothing separating the, the developers or the QA people yeah so in this company in Austin Texas they had conference rooms they were all the outside of the perimeter it was all conference rooms that if you needed a private place to meet to talk about things <coughs> there was a place to do that it was on the outside where it used to be what the, the upper mucky mucks offices right private offices were out there on the outside and all the worker bees were in the middle okay so they destroyed all of that sort of culture and they still provided private space but you had to make arrangements for it okay and so nobody had private space why did they do it it wasn't to save money I guarantee it wasn't to save money they wanted to increase the flow of information right that everybody had a better sense of what was happening. And if you overheard a conversation, follow up on it, right? So disrupting these walls, disrupt information, physical barriers do that, what else? Constant reorganizations, right? Disrupt the flow of information. When you don't know what else to do, reorganize, right? So that certainly disrupts the flow of knowledge. Trades and professions don't talk. Electricians don't talk to electrical engineers. Right? So those are barriers. Software systems don't talk to other software systems. Constant requests for information. Email pollution. <laughs> so disrupting the flow of knowledge. Designer overburdened too many projects. Right? You're assigned to five teams. Right? You spend all your time trying to get up to date before the next meeting when you meet. What's you know, you know. So you, you basically spend your time in meetings and getting ready for meetings. You don't get anything done. Right? So disrupting the flow of knowledge and then disrupting the absorption of knowledge. PowerPoint junk. Guilty. Endless review meetings, overly complex reports, overly complex written procedures, not testing to failure, not sharing learning gain thereby. So anyway, there is waste in all three areas. And we're going to introduce next session another one. Out of all of those, some of the engineers are about knowledge. So it would be interesting to sort of say, where do we waste knowledge? Um, what do people know that's never documented? Or there's not a way to retrieve that? Right? A lot of stuff. So if I think you think about it, uh, and we've talked about the marketing not providing sufficient uh, client value. OK. So you want to hang on for a few more minutes, and we'll finish up. Because somebody said more, it would be improvement to have it be shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Joe's back there. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's take ten or fifteen minutes here and just talk about what you got out of today's session. So chance. Um, one thing I liked at the very beginning was boundary analysis, and okay. so yeah, I work with data a lot at work, and. Um, we are constantly comparing, comparing things and looking at how far are we off from the standard or how far off okay. are we from the average. And um, you know, we're trying to even things out. Right. But there's definitely, like you said, there's definitely a lot of information in those points that are way far out there. And they're going to tell you something. There's a story there that, that you may not see if you're focusing in on just the what's, you know, how close you are to the standard. Yeah, the, the classical response to an outlier, whether it's on the high side or the low side, is it must be bad data. Right. Right. It must be bad data. But in fact, what it represents is an enormous opportunity, particularly on the high side, right? but also on the low side. What is causing them to be so far below the norm? Right? But so many of our analytical techniques, what do you first thing you do is you calculate the average. Right? And then you calculate the standard deviation hoping there's a small deviation, right? It's better if it's smaller than larger. But in fact, a larger deviation might in fact say, here's, how did that happen? 
If we could move that towards that higher end of that, this would be a tremendous accomplishment. Or if we could reduce errors to this low level. So, so those boundaries really represent opportunities for great improvement. And yet we get focused on the mean and then the standard deviation, but thinking standard deviation is bad, where standard deviation may represent an opportunity. Right? So it's, it's almost like our model that, we've, that we're given in statistics is average is the most important thing, and then low standard deviation would be the next most important thing. And it may not be that at all. Right? The, the most valuable information is not the average, and it's not the low standard deviation. It could very well be on the boundaries and understanding those boundaries, not trying to discredit them, but to understand them. I don't know if you've ever heard of techniques like linear programming and so on, but there are actually techniques for a set of data to f actually spell out those boundaries, right? And to go then look at those boundaries. Who is outperforming, either in the sense of being more productive or more efficient? Right? And so um, I've, I've done quite a bit of that, and I've actually supervised dissertations where we developed the techniques to do that, but it's called boundary analysis. Very, very interesting. Alan. Um, I never thought in the ways we have in the office uh, in a more deeper way as, as this session, but something that it's in this moment clear is that the production wider and wider and wider in the the companies and it's and it's supposed that that shouldn't be because right. we already have a uh, the computers that are made uh, may, uh, allow us to make uh, incredible connections to flow information but that it's not really happening in this moment yeah you you point out an interesting situation it's it's true of universities also okay that if you talk about universities there's faculty there's students okay and if you talk about universities are growing, it's not growing because of the number of faculty. It's growing because of all the support functions, right? Because now universities are almost like full service, right? You can not only get your education, but you can get health care. You, you can get entertainment in the form of athletics, right? Uh, you, you can get your workouts in that have nothing. You know, you've got recreational facilities. You've got housing facilities, right? So we've... So you got this whole notion now that we're really providing this whole, remember we talked about benefits, okay, and there's really a benefit package. Benefit packages become enormous, and in some cases it's taken away from what the direct value was supposed to be, right? What the direct value is supposed to be. So it's certainly true of companies, okay, uh, that the support staff are growing faster than the value, direct value add staff, right? And um, hence, your overhead becomes almost impossible. Um, I think I may have mentioned in here that we had a we had eight locations, nine hundred employees, and the the central staff myself consisted of myself and four people. That was our entire overhead. Right. Everything else was done at the plant, and none of our plants had more than three levels to them, plant manager, area manager, and then team manager. Right? And I may have mentioned we kept all of our sites below 100 people, right? Because the more you grow, the more overhead there is, okay? So we kept the location small, okay, to avoid a lot of overhead. And furthermore, in a small organization, people know more about what's going on. The larger the organization, the more isolated you are, right? But if there's only 10 people, you know what's happening with those 10 people. But if there's 10,000 people, all structured in silos, you probably have no idea what they do over there in that building, right? So I think it's important. A lot of the waste comes from the pure organizational structure, right, and where we think the value is. Emily. 
You got to smile, so you're going to hit us with something. Uh, I am. I'm going to change what I was going to say. So I read this book recently. I picked it up at a thrift shop um, by, it's Malcolm Gladwell, who's mm -hmm. like this marketing guru. Um, this book is called The Tipping Point, and he actually talks in there a little bit about this idea of the magic number 150, where they've done study on like ancient villages, organizations, where when they get about bigger than about 150 people, that's when you start getting isolation and people form sub packs. And apparently Gore-Tex took it to heart and they actually, all of their buildings uh, are in teams are under, under 150 people. And they don't like assign titles. Everyone's an associate and mm -hmm. they all do their own thing, but having that kind of under that but they don't put them in a box of a title yeah, yeah. no no box yeah. but everyone it helps with that flow of information right. marketing knows what engineering's doing mm -hmm. knows what sales and it things get done faster because they keep them on purpose small i mean sometimes it's just across the street but they you know this is your focus area like you know one gore-tex they mm -hmm. do the fashionable backpacks right. and another one does like the stuff for firefighters but by keeping it small is they keep that flow of information. Yeah, so our rule was 100, okay? Anytime we started, when you get over 100, we then broke it in separate locations, okay? You focus on these customers, these products. So we started over. So we're gonna come back to the point that you're making later on the course. We're gonna talk about something called work cells, okay? Work cells. You sort of said that, hey, this group would focus on these things. So typical manufacturing plant, is specialized by, by functional specialties. In other words, we have over here the machine shop. This is where they machine the product. Over here, we've got where people detail the product, okay? So we break that in, and so work comes in, and then it goes to these workstations. That's how we were typically organized, right? Typically organized. So there's this notion of work cells that we'll come back to examine, <coughs> which is that you take a class of products and you put all the equipment needed to produce that product in one small location, right? And what had before been a path for work to be completed that was thousands of feet long, suddenly now is not more than 15 or 20 feet, right? So all the, and it's typically arranged in a U format, right? So work comes in. People in that work cell schedule their own work. They can see when it's due, so they schedule it. There's not a scheduling department at all. Secondly, the workers are trained to carry out every function within that work cell. Right? So whatever is needed to produce this product, they can do it. Right? And we went from things taking weeks and in some cases months, turn around on a product that came in, or starting a product and finishing it, we reduced it to no more than a day and often hours. Right? Because the path, right? And everything was visible, right? People manage themselves. Okay, this is due by then, this is due, so what do we need to do next? Right? And people were general were trained in all the skills. Now, forced us to have more equipment but the improvement in value we could deliver to the customer, right? They call up and say, we want this, right? Hours later, we could make it. Didn't have to reschedule the whole plant. These people just rearranged the work themselves. Hey, we've got a rush job, do it. So there are structural changes we can do to implement that, but in some sense, smaller is better, right? And if you haven't read The Tipping Point by Gladwell, Read it, okay. It's a it's an interesting book. Sabrina. Um I really like the whole uh, the first how we see things. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty interesting. Okay. And I'm gonna read more about management by wandering around. But the whole general idea of eliminating waste, marketing waste, knowledge waste and operation waste. I, I, I feel like I'm getting more aware of these terms and thinking about my past and what mm -hmm. in my company, what was the waste that we did. But yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, if you think about, um, did I tell you this story about our reports in the forging plant? Yeah. Remember these were these huge reports every month that went to everybody for the whole plant, right? 
So that was information waste. I mean, we were producing stuff that was of no value, right? And it was just filed away in this room, right? So there is today a, a lot of written reports, right? In other words, you actually print it out. A lot of that could be waste. A lot of stuff can be distributed electronically. Doesn't need necessarily need to be printed. So we won't have any trouble finding waste as we look at it. Um, I think I definitely want to focus on models which will show us how to reduce waste. Uh -huh. Because uh, in my previous company, um, I can say for sure that there was a lot of operational waste. And uh, also, uh, when you spoke about flow of communication mm -hmm. among the departments, uh, we had good flow of communication. Like, uh, I was in the product development team, and we had good communication with the designers, with mm -hmm. the marketing people, with the manufacturing people, and still there was a lot of miscommunication. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think even with having a lot of communication, you tend to have wastage. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know how to get over that. Okay. So. Fair enough. I agree with you. Yeah. So, uh, the moonwalking bear uh, video, it clearly showed like how we miss on a lot of things uh, in, the, in the hunt for continuous improvements. We tend to miss a lot of other aspects which we will not be able to control or which we miss controlling. So, uh, I really liked that concept and, and also the, the focusing on waste part, the knowledge mm -hmm. waste, operational waste and marketing waste. There's definitely a lot of waste that I think in the first class, as you said, I think it's like 98% or mm -hmm. some percentage of 95, waste. 95, yeah. 95% of waste. A lot of room for improvements, but just that we have to be vigilant and more careful while doing things like the moonwalking bear video. So. Yeah, I mean, this course is intended to be optimistic. There's so much room for improvement, okay, that we literally can compete with anybody if we can find ways to see the waste, right? And remember, there's, we're talking about two kinds of waste now, client waste. In other words, we're not providing enough value to the you know, specified, expected, delightful value, right? So that there's waste there that we're not providing the right thing to them, or it doesn't integrate with other products that they have, right? That's big waste. And then 95% re referred to internal waste. So if you add those two together, there are incredible opportunities to improve. Jack. Uh, yeah, I, I, like, I also like the discussion of waste. Um, it kind of reminded me of this uh, saying that we learned in the product development course, which was make the right hit before you make it right. Because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, you can, if you're not marketing efficiently, then the whole operation side is, is waste. So I think it's going to be exciting to see how to cut down on waste and marketing and make sure you're getting the right thing. Okay, Neil? Yep. I, I never thought about the, the marketing waste. Um, my background is in manufacturing, so mm -hmm. I'm familiar with operations waste and the eight waste that go along with that. And But I never looked at marketing waste being the big waste that if we don't get that right, then it really doesn't matter the rest of it, so. And now sort of remember, we're taking marketing at three levels, next step in the process, end user, person who writes the check. And so now we're talking about value, the value to the next step in the process. So don't just think about marketing, which is typically concerned with outside clients. You have your direct clients, right? And so the, the starting point is not to improve the efficiency of your operation. The starting point is to understand the value that I can provide to the next step in the process. And which model do you want to use to begin to s talk about that value? Right? So in this course, you're going to be marketing is inherent to it. Because you're talking about marketing is providing value to the next <coughs> step in the process. Right? My system purpose is to provide value probably to internal clients maybe multiple clients. What are the next steps in the process? So set aside the marketing folks. They're off over there. That's really at the organizational level. When we talk about client value and big waste, big waste is if I'm not giving the value that the next step in the process needs. Dave, you're up. I thought there was a 
I guess there was a lot of stuff that I feel like I got out of today. Um, I guess one of my favorites or whatever was uh, your point that there was like every every model lets you like see what's in the model, but kind of blinds you to what's not in the model. Um, so you suggested having multiple models that you looked at to kind of cover all your bases or something. And I thought that was interesting. It reminded me of um, the like diversified portfolios that we discussed in financial management. So right. I guess that um, the crossover was interesting for me. But yeah, I guess it just made a lot of sense trying to, I guess like almost like a CYA approach. Like you can still, even though um, the like numbers might not always be the best thing to look at, give your customers, whether that be managers or whoever else and having multiple things for them to look at it seems I, I don't know i guess i got excited that seemed like a good idea okay so to go back to the beginning the question is seeing is important right and we tried to outline some various ways to see so you might just ask yourself how do you currently in your professional roles how do you see right how do you see client value, what tools do you use to do that? Are there some additional tools you could e use to better see client value? And then we'll move on to the second step is now that you understand what value you want to deliver to your clients, how can I do it with the least possible waste? Right, so where is the waste in how I'm doing things? And we're going to spend the next session talking about the various kinds of operational waste. Right? And the purpose then, remember, longer term of finding waste in our internal step in the, is to be able to provide new value, right? And improve our prospects for the future. It might be new value to current clients, or it might be new value to new clients. Right? So those are the steps that we're engaged on. Anything else? I met the objective here. Joe left even early. See, she's she's not even on our screen. Okay. <laughs> Everything going okay in the course otherwise? Application briefs working? Okay. I like the, uh, the, the new thing with the discussion contributions with the picture. Somebody posted a cartoon. Yeah. That I thought was pretty great. Yeah, I think the discussion contributions are going well from what I can see. I think you, you're really bouncing things off of each other and getting value from that. Uh, again, I think a lot of the value of the course will come from those. So I'm really, I'm glad to see that there are relatively few. There are 203 words, okay, <laughs> kind of thing where people are counting words instead of trying to really struggle with the concept. So um, I think we're off to a pretty good start, and we'll see you next week. has another book that I haven't read yet. Gladwell? Called, yeah, it's called Outliers. I'm so I wonder oh, yeah, what that's yeah, no, about. I've heard of that one. Yeah. See, I, thought, I knew I'd heard his name before. I, I've heard of... Oh, see, I haven't read that. This is the first one. I first heard about him. He did this TED Talk about, like, spaghetti sauce. Spaghetti sauce? Oh, my God. It's, like, one of my favorite TED Talks. Yeah, he talks about awesome. another guy who... It's like, kind of like the milkshake thing, right? Kind of like the... It's more of instead of, like, the finding the perfect... Pepsi, sauce. the perfect Pepsis, and instead of like, oh, what's the perfect spaghetti sauce, grouping it, like, for some people it's chunky, for some people it's meaty, and... Yeah, that's right, the segmentation thing. That's how, yeah, I ran into him, but apparently he's got a couple books, and this, um, I just finished The Tipping Point, it's like, fascinating, he doesn't always give answers, it's all like questions. What's his name again? Malcolm Gladwell. But he had, Link is his biggest one. Goes back. That's, is that the, that's the first impressions one, I think, right? I think so. I yeah. haven't read that one yet. But that's on my list, and Outliers is on my list. He's the guy with the 10,000 hours idea, right? Isn't that Malcolm Gladwell? I'm not sure. He's something like 10,000 hours and become an expert at it. 10,000 hours. I don't know. I feel like that was around longer than him, but maybe I've just heard about oh, it. Joe's back. <laughs> Joe, we finished up. Sorry, I. Oh. Well, you said you said there'd be more value if we did it in a shorter amount of time. So we I know. Thank you. So, what was your takeaway? Uh,
I think someone said it, but I, I liked the um, Moonwalking Bear video. I thought that was cool. I already sent it to some friends. <laughs> Super. All right. <laughs> See you next week. Thank you. Sorry about that.